What if we told you that the world that you see around, a world of cutting edge technology, science and progress, information and modernity, owes its existence, its origin to one book, one man, and one of the greatest civilizations the world has ever seen. Join us in discovering the Quranic roots of the biggest scientific revolution that went on to create modern science and then our modern world. Imagine if you had access to the entire human history in the form of a movie. And just like a movie, you could move ahead and go back whenever you wanted. What would you see? Beauty, inspiration, power, misery, rise and fall, deceit and truth. But above all, you would see paradox, unexpected, unfathomable paradox. We start our journey with a major event in history. It is 1492 and Christopher Columbus has just set foot on what he thinks is Asia, but actually were the Bahamas. The historical voyage was made possible by a severe miscalculation. Columbus used the data of a Muslim astronomer, al Farghani, but mistook the longer Arabic mile to be the smaller Roman mile, causing him to underestimate the Earth's circumference, hence believing that he could take a shortcut to India. Columbus with this error placed Asia where North America sits and was completely ignorant of the existence of the Pacific Ocean. When most European navigators considered westward voyage from Europe to Asia unfeasible and dangerous, Columbus, with his tremendous miscalculation, went on board. But what's more interesting is that he did not fear falling off from the edge of the flat earth. Or in other words, the concept of the earth being spherical in shape was common knowledge in medieval Europe. In fact, the spherical earth is as old as Greek science, with Eratosthenes being the first person to calculate the circumference of the earth. So now that we are talking about India, we go to another scientist in 1037, who standing on top of a mountain in the Indian subcontinent has devised an ingenious way to calculate the radius of the earth using trigonometric calculations. This is Al-Biruni, who now has an impact crater on the moon named after him. This is someone who theorized the existence of the Americas based on his accurate calculation of the circumference of the Earth with less than 1% error and his expertise in geology. So this is a man in the Middle East who saw America on the other side of the globe just through his calculations. Columbus then should have learned and America should have been called Birunica. was the round earth a complete given in the Muslim world in the Golden Age. Rather, from very early on, Muslim astronomers invented the brand new discipline of spherical trigonometry for calculating the direction of the Qibla for their five daily prayers, already incorporating the round earth. Now let's go to two theologians who were scientists as well, from two different theological schools, different eras and different countries, but coincided on this one point, the spherical earth. Ibn Hazm and Fakhreddin al-Razi used the Quran and mathematical geography to prove the earth was round. Fakhreddin al-Razi writes, if it is said, do the words of the Quran, 
and the earth we have spread out indicate that it is flat, we would respond yes because even though it is round, it is an enormous sphere and each little part of this enormous sphere, when it is looked at, appears to be flat. Ibn Hazm added, none of those who deserve being imams for Muslims has denied that the earth is round and we have not received anything that indicates a denial, not even a single word. The fact that the concept of sphericity of the earth was established through mathematics and the Quran by theologians like Imam Suyuti, Ibn Taymiyyah and Al-Nisapuri shows how the pursuit of science and a pursuit of religion was one and the same road leading to that one God. So fierce was this pursuit that even if it meant contradicting the great Greek philosopher Aristotle on critical issues, they would do so. We see this in the case of Ali Kushji, a Persian astronomer who wrote on the rotation of the earth on its axis based on observational astronomy and mathematics. He explicitly uh, criticizes uh, Aristotle and his message is simple. We believe in our math and observations. Aristotle and Ptolemy can be wrong. Guess who made use of this information and this attitude of skepticism? Galileo and Copernicus, founders of the modern scientific revolution. Or the question is, were they? We now go to 1548. A man is on his deathbed. He, in his last moments, is presented with a copy of his entire life's hard work, his groundbreaking book. Little does he know that this book will revolutionize Europe and then the world forever. The man is Copernicus, and the book is derevolutionist which has his idea of the sun being at the centre of the universe and the earth moving around. This opinion conflicted severely with the prevailing Christian belief, so the best thing Copernicus thought was to delay the publishing of his work till his last moments, when he could be spared from the criticism of the church. But after paying our respects to this great scientist, we want to go deeper into how he arrived at this radical conclusion. There had been people before him who had proposed a sun-centric universe, but he had provided planetary models to substantiate his views. And more importantly, his book is considered the biggest triumph of science over dogmatic religion and ushered in the scientific revolution. It was not until 1957 that Austrian mathematician and historian of science Otto Neugebauer found striking similarities between the lunar model of Copernicus and that of Muslim astronomer Ibn Shatir written some 200 years back. Copernicus had also incorporated the geometric solutions of other Muslim astronomers like Nasir al-Din al-Tusi and al-Urdi. Add to this the discovery of German scientist and polymath Willy Hartner in 1975 that even the diagrams are same detail by detail, down to their alphabetical designation, where Tusi uses Alif, Copernicus uses A where Tusi uses Ba, Copernicus uses B, and so on. So the question then is, did Copernicus really start the scientific revolution? We stop in 2018, and we see the entire world shining with the advances in technology. Can you imagine a world without technology? The GPS that we use in our cars is a proof that Einstein's theory was correct. But when he published his paper in 1905, it needed proof, experimental, empirical proof to be accepted by the world. And that is the foundation on which our science is built, 
the scientific method. Nothing is taken as scientific truth unless it is experimentally verified. So we go back to see when was this radical method adopted. It is 1267 and the famous philosopher Roger Bacon presents his Opus Majus to the Pope. Apart from having a very strong occult overtone to this book, he writes theories supplied by reason should be verified by sensory data aided by instruments. This is the birth of the scientific method, a new era in history much like an earthquake of knowledge and inventions is about to commence. However, we see the last chapter in this book of Roger Bacon, who was known to practice magic and believed that he could talk to the dead, is on optics by an Iraqi physicist Ibn al-Haytham. We go to Cairo, 1011. Ibn al-Haytham, just to save his neck from the ill-tempered caliph who had commissioned him to construct a nearly impossible hydraulic system on the Nile, feigned madness and remained in house arrest for a decade. And that decade is by far the most crucial for humanity. He writes his famous book on optics and officially formulates the scientific method that greatly influenced the likes of Roger Bacon, Francis Bacon and eventually Isaac Newton. Ibn al-Haytham also wrote on theology and his inspiration for devising the scientific method explicitly is the Quranic message of drawing close to God through observing physical phenomena around. Something he expresses in these words, I constantly sought knowledge and truth and it became my belief that for gaining access to the effulgence and closeness to God, there is no better way than that of searching for truth and science. Now we take the scientific method for granted. Uh, but in Ibn al Haytham's time, it wasn't that obvious. It was a very big leap from speculative theories and philosophy that characterized earlier traditions like those of the Greeks and the Indians to say that we can discern science fact from fiction by repeated experimentation is based on a very bold assumption that the universe has truth embedded in it. And this is a very Quranic notion. Ibn al-Haytham's writing reveal that inspiration from the Quran made him understand that in a universe of change, the only thing that is permanent and stable are the laws of nature, or as the Quran calls them, Sunnatullah. Nature is referred to as the habit of God in the Quran. It was this idea of an unchanging side to nature or sunnatullah that allows for repeated experimentation. And there it was, the foundation of modern science, born out of the Quranic worldview.